Hello, everyone. My name is Cindy Black, and I am the Executive Director of Fix Democracy First. And um, I'm going to be your host for this evening, along with the League of Women Voters of Seattle King County. And you're here for Unrig, How to Fix Our Broken Democracy book launch with Daniel Newman. We also have a special guest tonight, Estevan Munoz Howard, who we'll be introducing shortly. Um, so before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about Fix Democracy first, if you don't know about us. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit group here in Washington state working on democracy form for money in elections, voting access and rights, public funding of elections, civic education, and anything to help strengthen our democracy. Um, we work on that and work with a lot of organizations, including organizations like the League of Women Voters. So right now I would like to introduce um, one our co-sponsor for this evening before we introduce our guest um, speakers. And um, Alyssa Weed, who is the president of Seattle King County League of Women Voters. So I'm gonna go ahead and pin her video and have her speak. Welcome, Alyssa. Hi, thank you so much for having me, Cindy. Um, we are super excited to be participating in this event tonight. For those of you who might not be familiar with the League of Women Voters, we are a nonpartisan nonprofit dedicated to informing voters and fighting for good public policy. Uh, and the issue of money and politics and campaign financing is something that we have been heavily involved in as an organization officially since the 1970s, um, both nationally and even locally here in Seattle, we were huge supporters of I-22, the Honest Elections Ordinance, and we are really excited to continue the work here and hear from our guests today about where this fight is going and raise awareness and try to uh, empower all of you to learn more about reforms in campaign finance that are possible at the local, state, and national level. So thank you so much for tuning in, and I'm very excited to hear from everyone else. Great. Thank you so much, Alyssa. I really appreciate you be being a co-sponsor for this event tonight. And um, before we bring up the author who's going to talk about tonight's book, Unrig, How to Fix Our Broken Democracy, and it wouldn't be a book launch if I didn't have a copy of the book to show you. Here you go. Hardcover book. We're going to go into detail, but it is a graphic novel. I'm very excited about this, actually, for a lot of reasons. Um, the first person I want to bring up is Esteban Munoz Howard. And um, Esteban is featured in the book. Esteban currently is a senior program officer with the Piper Fund, where he oversees grant making to support state municipal money in politics reforms. Um, before joining Proteus Fund, he helped lead the successful Honest Elections Seattle campaign of 2015, the historic initiative that brought us the Seattle Voucher Program, whose efforts are, as I mentioned, featured in UNRIG. So Esteban, he previously worked as the Development Director for Arts Corps and Social Justice Fund Northwest and as the Executive Director of the Youth Media Institute. He's a passion about youth engagement, community organizing, and the diffusion of power. Esteban previously served as the president of the Washington Bus Education Fund, and he currently serves on the board of Rainier Valley Corps. And in 2015, uh, Fixed Democracy First, we honored him, honored him as Democracy Volunteer of the Year. So I am going to now go ahead and turn it over to Esteban. Go ahead, Esteban. Great. Well, thank you so much for, for that introduction, Cindy. Um, I realize um, I have did failed to update my bio. I just recently stepped off the, the board of Rainier Valley Corps, but I did step onto the board of the Progress Alliance of Washington and continue to support uh, a number of organizations. So I really uh, appreciate being able to be here. Thank you all for joining us and to Fix Democracy First and League of Women Voters for putting this event together. Um, I use he, him pronouns, just wanted to, to mention and, um, and also uh, am happy to serve as a senior program officer with the Piper Fund, as you mentioned, uh, where I run our money and politics reform grant making program. 
And um, yeah, it's just really an honor to be able to be here to talk about democracy reform and some of the, the inspiring stories that have been captured in Dan's book. Um, I'll say that I was honored for the Seattle story to be included in this collection at all, uh, and for my character to have a small role in narrating part of what we were able to build here in Seattle. Um, in part because there were just a whole lot of people who were involved, a lot of organizations uh, who made all of this possible, many of whom were themselves keys to our success. Um, and it's been really cool to see several of us depicted as comic book characters. Um, and so I thank you, Dan, for including us all in, uh, in this book and really helping capture that story. Um, so for, for those of you who may not be familiar, in 2015, Seattle voters uh, passed the world's first democracy voucher program, um, uh, which provides adult residents with four $25 vouchers to contribute to qualified candidates of their choice. Um, and so it's a new system of campaign public financing um, and it's a way for cities and states to be able to mitigate the influence of money in politics and ensure communities feel more represented in their democracy. It's one of several tools, several sort of policy solutions that can be pursued. And it's been um, particularly exciting um, here in Seattle. Um, the, the coalition was successful in 2015 due to deep support from groups like Fix Democracy First, League of Women Voters, Washington Can, Win Win Network, and Sightline Institute, among several others. Um, but in truth, the roots of the Honest Election Seattle campaign stretch back much further than, than just five years ago. Um, it's, it, it, like I said, there, there were a lot of folks who were involved, and you can read the full story in the book, uh, so I won't spoil it for you. Um, but I will say that the effort um, really started with about 10 folks back in 2008. Uh, most of whom were, were in some way connected to Fix Democracy First, although at that time it was called Washington Public Campaigns. And, and really this, uh, the effort to, to create a public financing system in Seattle started because we all felt a similar pull, pull to do something that would address the influence of money in our democracy. And, and it was largely because we all saw how consistently the influence of money undermines every issue we care about. Right? Corporations prevent progress on climate change. The prison industrial complex blocks criminal justice reform. Pharmaceutical companies fight efforts to make healthcare accessible. Their, their power to distort and influence policy decision, decisions really come from their ability to distort and influence elections through financial contributions. And, and it's something that we all know and, and recognize, but I think sometimes it can be hard to really see the power that we have to do something about it. Um, sometimes I think this, this feels like a problem that is, um, that it, it is impossible to address. Um, and, and I think this is one reason why Dan's book is so important, why, why it's important to be able to lift up some of these stories of, of how we can all make a difference and, and learn from some of the, the past efforts where folks have been successful to advance policies that, that really do shift the balance of power and put more power in the hands um, of, of regular people. Right? At the end of the day, we all have the power to organize our friends and family and to volunteer with community-based organizations and, and run for office and write letters and learn about policies that would make our democracy more equitable. And at the end of the day, we can all plug into organizations like Fix Democracy First and League of Women Voters, which are leading some really exciting work to build momentum for democracy reform statewide. Um, and for folks who are not based in Washington, there are a ton of organizations, um, some of whom I'm fortunate enough to be able to work with in my, my role with the, the Piper Fund, um, you know, where we can really um, see some, some momentum building to, to make positive reforms. And, um, and so I'm, I'm excited for you all to be able to check this book out. Um, I am fortunate enough to have been able to, to receive a copy and, 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 and also be inspired by the stories that are contained within um, and for, for all of us to learn more about some of the ways that regular folks have made a difference and hopefully find some inspiration uh, for our collective future. So with that, I'd love to then turn to Daniel Newman and, and introduce Dan. He's a friend and of course, author of Unrig, How to Fix Our Broken Democracy. Um, Dan is a national expert on government accountability and money in politics. He's president and co-founder of Maplight, a national uh, nonpartisan uh, nonprofit that promotes transparency and political reform. 
He's won numerous awards and has appeared in hundreds of media outlets. Uh, I won't begin to name them all. Um, he lives in the San Francisco Bay Area and he's here to talk about his new book and, um, and we're happy to have him. So without further ado, Dan. Thank you so much, Esteban. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and um, and thank you to listen. Thank you to Cindy uh, to Fix Democracy First and the League of Women Voters of Seattle, King County do such important work in helping to fix our democracy. And as I mentioned in my book, toward the end when it's what you can do, unrigging our democracy is not something you do by yourself. It's something you, you do with other people. And there are so many stories in my book and throughout the country of a pretty small group of people getting together and making major change happen. And that's one of the themes that I'm aiming to bring out. So I'm especially uh, pleased that this book is coming out at this really difficult moment for our country. We have heightened attention on racial justice and the ways in which that the ways in which that our democracy really has not done a good job of including everyone. And of course, we're all here stuck in our homes in shelter in place in COVID-19 due in large part to our government's absolute unpreparedness for this health crisis. And I'll talk more about that a bit later. So in my book, Unrig, I talk about number one, the key rules of democracy. Uh, and number two, how the wealthy have rigged these rules for their own benefit so they don't work for the rest of us. And uh, number three, the solutions across the country that are unrigging these rules to make democracy actually work for everyone. And number four, inspiring stories of the people who are actually bringing this change about. I cover voting and voter suppression, gerrymandering, electing a president, president and also uh, political money, among other topics. And so I'm going to start out giving a bit of an introduction to what the book is about uh, by reading from it and, and also show you a bit about some stories about political money. And of course, since this is a graphic novel, a comic book, I'm going to show it to you as well as tell it to you. So there's the first panel of the book right up there on the screen. Hi, I'm Dan Newman. When I was growing up, I learned that democracy here in America is about government by and for the people. Everyone's voice is supposed to matter and our elected leaders are supposed to act to help everyone. But over time, I noticed that's not how it works in practice. Say you wanna help solve the childhood obesity crisis. A law adding fresh fruit to school breakfast was proposed in California to do just that. But there was a problem. Food processing companies don't earn money from fresh fruit, only canned and processed fruit. And through their influence, the language in the law was changed from fresh fruit to nutritious fruit. Looking behind the scenes reveals that the food processing industry gave more than $1 million to the campaigns of more than 200 state lawmakers in the years before the vote. And taxpayer money intended for fresh fruit was instead used to serve kids canned fruit and sugar syrup, just so that food processing companies can make more money. This kind of corruption is happening on an industrial scale, affecting every aspect of our lives, from the air we breathe, to the schools our kids attend, to whether we can afford to see a doctor or buy a home. Why are food processing companies and big banks and oil companies, drug manufacturers, and every other wealthy industry allowed to bribe politicians like this? Why are they allowed to give money and get favors in return? It's unjust and it's the opposite of how our, um, how our democracy is supposed to work. Instead of government by and for the people, it's government by and for the corporations and the billionaires, yet it's legal according to the rules. The rules I'm talking about determine who controls government. These are the rules of political power, like who can run for office, who can give money to politicians, how votes are counted and more. There's a misperception that democracy issues are just too complicated to understand, but that's something that the forces of anti-democracy, which I'll get to a bit later, uh, want us to think. It's actually not that complicated if you just take some time to learn about it and get involved with one of the great groups that's actually working to fix it. So now I'm going to tell you two stories. One comes from uh, 
uh, comes from Pennsylvania, a candidate named Paul Perry. He's a real person, like all the stories in my book. Paul ran for Congress in Pennsylvania. And then I'm going to tell you the story of Teresa Mosqueda, who also ran for office for city council in Seattle and what their different experiences were like. You'll meet Paul Perry, like the other people whose stories appear in this book. He's a real person. Paul decided to run for Congress. On paper, I was an ideal candidate for Democrats, says Paul. Born and raised in my Philadelphia district, a successful career in education and nonprofit work, Ivy League graduate, young, black, with gay parents, and therefore a compelling family story. Public service was my life's work. I was tired of seeing kids and families not get the support they deserve from our government. I wanted to help people like Geraldine, a soft-spoken woman with cancer. Geraldine was worried about schemes to upend Obamacare since she depended on it to stay alive and get her medications. I'll never forget the way her face lit up when I told her I'll, I'd fight for affordable, universal health care if elected. The process of actually running for office is a puzzle, even though I had a political science degree. As a new candidate, you're in the wilderness. I asked for advice from the people I was told are the gatekeepers to power in my district, like the Democratic Party endorsers who say, money is money. We need a candidate who can raise a lot of it so we can win. And the progressive groups who say, you share our values, but we're going to hold off on endorsing you. We're waiting on the fundraising numbers. I, I wasn't naive. I knew it was about fundraising. It was the depth and scope and overwhelmingness of it that got to me. You wake up at 8 a.m., your finance director shows up, you spend most of the day calling people to ask them for money, every day. If you're lucky, you get out to evening events. So much of it is just tied to the numbers. The first official communication I received from the National Democratic Party said essentially, welcome to the race, now raise $200,000 in the next two weeks. In other words, we don't care who you are, just show us the money. Support from the party is important and how much money you raise is about the only way they evaluate you. I wanted to be elected so I could affect change, but the process was debilitating. I saw myself becoming less of an attentive son, less of a good partner to my girlfriend and less of a good friend. I started thinking about my friends as dollar signs and opportunities and angles. I didn't like the person the constant fundraising was turning me into. When most people run for Congress, their friends and family pony up thousand dollar checks. My friends can't afford that. They're teachers and social workers. I'm a millennial with more than 200,000 in student loan debt. If I was going to raise more, I needed to expand outside my friends and family network into the stratosphere of big donors. I was running against a lobbyist tapped into the deepest pockets in Harrisburg and DC and a state senator married to a millionaire. I've gotten a taste of what this was like in the stratosphere of big donors. At a high powered fundraising event for a nearby member of Congress, I worked the room, swatting away consultants looking for contracts, absorbing cheap shots from the white haired trial lawyers who scoffed at my youthful candidacy, always seeking out the fattest Wallace in the room. I didn't feel like I was making real change. I was spending my days shaking down rich people for money. About six months in, we were badly outraised. My lead opponent had raised $400,000. I had raised $90,000, and that was hustling, doing everything I could. I decided to leave the race. It was so early in the race, too. It's dispiriting and disheartening how power and influence really works. To win, you need the currency of power. There's actual currency, and there's also connections and networks of influence and spheres of control. I spent a lot of my days positioning myself for what powerful people were willing to do for me and with me. The process maps so directly onto the economic and class privilege in our society, and in many cases, racial privilege. It shapes candidates, even progressives like me, into becoming the types of politicians we should be fighting against. The time spent courting donors disconnects you from voters by design. I came to realize that when we let wealth and connections drive who gets elected, we get the dismal politics we now awaken to every morning. I ran for Congress to help people who need support the most. But the system points you to pay attention to the people who don't deserve as much of your attention. The people who need you the least have the most influence over you just because of the way the system is structured. That's the deepest, saddest irony. Now onward to Seattle. 
Paul Perry found that running for Congress forces candidates to people focus on the people funding their campaigns. In most elections, that means people with fat wallets. But what if campaign money came from the community instead? Welcome to Seattle and meet Teresa Mosqueda, a third generation Mexican American and daughter of educators and activists. Teresa grew up in the Pacific Northwest and you can see Bigfoot over in the corner of this frame there. As a leader in the Washington state labor movement and a public health advocate, Teresa helped raise the state minimum wage and pass paid sick leave and led a program to make sure every child in Washington could receive health care. We've covered 96% of the kiddos in our state, she says. At age 36, she decided to run for Seattle City Council. As a renter with student debt and a young woman of color, she was not a traditional candidate. She had lots of community support, but not much financial backing. Instead of spending her days calling wealthy people for a large donation, she knocked on doors and talked with voters. We need affordable housing and childcare. Many times, the conversations ended with voters giving Teresa $100 in democracy vouchers. She raised $300,000 in democracy vouchers to power her campaign, and she went on to win her election without becoming beholden to corporations and the rich. Now, wait a minute, what's a democracy voucher? In 2015, Seattle voters passed a ballot measure that gives every city resident $100 they can use to support candidates for city council, mayor, and other city offices. Each election season, these democracy vouchers are mailed to voters. Seattleites can give vouchers to candidates of their choice, and candidates trade in the vouchers to the city for money to run their campaigns. Before Seattle started the democracy vouchers program, the city's political donors were not representative of the city as a whole. As this report from Sightline Institute said, who funds Seattle's political candidates? Rich white people with view homes, which they proved with real estate data. In 2017, when the democracy vouchers program first rolled out, Seattle residents from all across the city gave 80,000 vouchers to candidates. That first year, Seattle candidates could use vouchers in Teresa's city council race and some other races, but not in the race for mayor, although that will be allowed in the future. That difference, provided an opportunity to measure the difference between contests with vouchers and contests without. Voucher donors, as you can see in the map on the right, were more numerous, more geographically diverse, and better matched the city's population overall. Everyday people can now provide major funding to candidates. Now I can afford to contribute to, contribute to candidates I like. Big money has always participated. Now we can participate too. And candidates can now focus their attention on representing all the people instead of just the rich people. Teresa had been asked to run for office before, but money was a huge barrier. I'm still paying off my student loans. Democracy vouchers broke down that barrier. Teresa became the youngest member and the only renter on the Seattle City Council where she works to lift up the voices of workers women and people of color so that every voice matters in our democracy. So how did this great success story happen? Here's a secret of unrigging the rules. You can move mountains with just a handful of committed people. How many people did it take to start unrigging Seattle's elections? Just 10. And here are the 10 that started Honest Election in Seattle. The book goes on to tell the story uh, of their campaign and its ups and downs. I don't see many stories about what it's really like to put something together with a group of people and actually change your city. There's not that much in the media about it. There's not that much in other books. And it was a priority of mine to really bring this story forward so that um, you and other people reading this book can see yourselves in the story. So money in politics, as Estevan said, it affects every issue of our lives. And what I want to note is about police violence and this link that it has to money and politics. And one of the contributing factors to police violence is a lack of accountability. District attorneys are the uh, typically elected government official that have the ability to prosecute police misconduct. But because of our broken money and politics system, these district attorneys run for office dependent on interest groups for those campaigns. And one of those interest groups is police unions. And so many, many elected district attorneys in this country receive significant funding from police unions. And of course, when it comes to 
deciding whether or not to prosecute police misconduct, how can they really make a decision in the interest of the broader public if they're dependent on their reelection from police union money? Similarly, some cities have police review boards where uh, civilians can review police misconduct cases. And whether or not your city has a commission like that and what its powers are is dependent on the mayor and city council who are also in too many cases dependent on police union money. So one of the many ways in which the underlying rules of democracy affect so many issues that we care about. Now on the topic of COVID-19 and our government's utter unpreparedness for this, this is the result of a 50 year campaign by a well-organized group uh, of extremely wealthy people, Charles and David Koch, you may have heard of the Koch Network perhaps, among others, who really want to discredit government. And that's one of the reasons that our government was so unprepared and why we are all stuck at home. And I'm gonna go, the book uh, tells this story and I'm gonna go on to, um, to share some of that with you. As we work to unrig the rules so that our country works for everyone, it helps to know who's working to rig those rules so that our country serves only the very wealthy. That's the forces of anti-democracy, the people who want to rig the rules. A small group of extremist billionaires has been working for more than a half century to change our country to their liking in a way that will hollow out our democracy. They want to turn the United States into a fiefdom where the very wealthy make the laws and control the government. They want to eliminate public schools, minimum wage laws, social security, the environmental protection agency, all income taxes, and all forms of government assistance to those who need help and much more. Sometimes this group of billionaires is referred to as the radical right. They are indeed radical, but this phrase doesn't fully capture what they're seeking to accomplish. Instead, I call them the wealth hoarders. Over many years, They've devoted billions of dollars to hundreds of organizations and thousands of political candidates all towards these ends, and they are winning. And I go on to tell this story in detail based on the books Dark Money by Jane Mayer and Democracy in Chains by Nancy McLean. And here's a bit more of that story. Here's the ideology of the wealth hoarders. Rich people don't need government. Instead of public schools, they can afford private schools. Instead of public parks, they have their own estates. They can pay for private security patrols and private health care. They don't rely on social security. They have all the retirement money they need. Most rich people though, like the rest of us, understand that taxes are part of the price of living in a civilized society. Taxes allow the government to accomplish what's needed for Americans as a whole. Taxes pay for public education so that all children have a better chance to achieve their potential. They pay for social security, which dramatically reduces poverty. They pay for regulations on commerce, which help prevent companies from exploiting workers and creating monopolies. Other regulations block factories from poisoning the air and Wall Street banks from wrecking the economy. We all pay something, so we have a collective benefit, a society that works better than it would if everyone fended for themselves. The wealth hoarders, though, think differently. Everyone is out for themselves. I've already got mine. Why should I pay taxes to help anyone else? And so skipping ahead in the book, here's where that ideology gets them in terms of what they want for this country. The wealth hoarders agenda for the country follows from their ideology. Their agenda in the world, in the words of David, uh, excuse me, of Charles Koch, tear government out at the root. Charles Koch and his late brother, David Koch, uh, are two of the wealthiest people in the world. And they are, uh, uh, Charles uh, is the leader of this network that has been tr seeking for the last 50 years to put this philosophy into practice of tearing out government at the root. They spelled out in detail what they seek in 1980, when the Kochs supported the Libertarian Party presidential candidate presidential candidate, Ed Clark, who was running against Ronald Reagan, saying that Reagan is too liberal. They made David Koch the vice presidential candidate so he could avoid campaign finance limits and spend unlimited money on the campaign. And David Koch provided 60% of the campaign's budget. 
And their published presidential platform, if implemented, would wipe out government as we know it. And this is an actual document from the 1980 Libertarian Party policy platform. It would abolish public schools and required education of children, minimum wage, child labor laws, social security, Medicare, Medicaid, all campaign finance laws, the Environmental Protection Agency, Securities and Exchange Commission, FDA, FBI, CIA, eliminate all income, corporate and capital gains taxes, eliminate prosecution of tax evaders, and eliminate all forms of welfare for low income people. Now the result on election day, they got just 1% of the vote. And because in 1980, most Americans despise the wealth hoarders aims as they still do today. Still, Charles and David Koch kept at it, seeking ways to make their deeply unpopular vision a reality. And they found answers in the work of economist James Buchanan, who sought similar ends. Buchanan saw that in a modern inclusive democracy, the wealth hoarders' unpopular ideas would always lose. So Buchanan developed and promoted strategies to cripple and bind democracy, to stop it from reflecting the interests of the majority of the people. And in the words of Buchanan, we must remove the sacrosanct status assigned to majority rule. Buchanan saw that individual politicians come and go, but the rules of elections and government are what determine over time which interests win. And he was fond of saying the problems of our times require attention to the rules rather than the rulers. Buchanan dreamed of a government barred by constitutional law from offering social programs or regulating businesses and wealth, even when most people want these things. The government unresponsive to the majority, instead privileging the interests of the wealthy few. The Kochs put these strategies into action. And in a phenomenon never before seen in history, a small group of billionaires has organized and funded a comprehensive long-term assault on American democracy that continues today. The last story I'll tell today is that of Samantha Parsons. For every paid wealth hoarder minion, there's someone out there standing up to them, like Samantha Parsons. As an 18-year-old college freshman in 2012, Samantha heard an odd story about the professor in a friend's economic class. Here's your textbook. If you want to debate climate change, leave and don't come back. Samantha and other students soon discovered that the economics program at their school, George Mason University in Virginia, was heavily funded by the Kochs. They started asking questions, wondering if the Koch funds were influencing what students were being taught. They met with faculty who were also concerned and had been bravely speaking out. Are we a university that can be sold to the highest bidder? The faculty and students pressed the school administration for copies of gift agreements from big donors, but were stonewalled. The students found volunteer legal help and sued the university under freedom of information laws. The university was forced to release gift agreements that were previously hidden, generating national headlines like this New York Times headline, what Charles Koch and other donors to George Mason University got for their money. The gift agreements revealed the ugly truth. The Kochs had helped choose faculty members and biased what was taught for decades. Said one student leader, the point of the university is to serve students. I trusted GMU to look out for our education. I feel betrayed. While advocating for transparency at GMU, Samantha helped start Uncoke My Campus, a group supporting activists in exposing and ending Coke influence nationwide. And in 2019, GMU changed its policies so all future gift agreements would be made public, one of a string of transparency victories at campuses nationwide. Thank you. And, um, and Cindy, it's a pleasure to be here, and I believe we're now going to take some questions. Great. Yes, we do have some questions for you. Um, let's start with David. Um, he has a couple of things. One is says, yes, uh, I am running for an unpaid office that is very important, but it is clear it is not easy for many non-native English speakers and no a ASL uh, version either, just to start off with the FEC. Um, and then he asked about the book becoming a, a part of the Washington library system so people that don't have money can have access to it. Uh, so on the second point first, uh, 
We um, I'm fortunate that some copies of the book are up. Uh, the our, my website unrigbook.com has the whole chapter of the wealth orders that I just showed you a part of, and there's a chapter on voting rights and voting suppression that went up on a site called Truth Out. So there's ways uh, you can read the book even from home. Uh, but I do expect this book to be to very popular with with libraries. In terms of language access, you know, language access to to the ballot has been um, a big issue in in voting rights and over. The, the past 40 years or so, there has been expansion. So, uh, so governments do have to provide language access. And that's an important part, of course, of making sure that everyone is included in democracy. Thank you. Um, the next question from a different David. So is capitalism detrimental to democracy? And is there a period in US history where democracy did work? And if yes, when and why did it break? That's a big question. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So I think capitalism and democracy, you know, I, I think really like every democratic country in the world is, is trying to figure that out. But there are certainly lots of democratic uh, countries that have uh, capitalism and they, they work much better in the U.S. And, than the U.S. in terms of actually caring for their people. Now, in terms of the, the times that democracy worked better, I mean, when the, um, at the time of the Constitutional Convention, um, uh, over 200 years ago, of course, only 6% of Americans could vote, and that was mostly wealthy white men. And over time, the, in the country's history, there's been a story of expansion of voting, but that expansion has not been uniform, and sometimes it's been greater, and then sometimes it's been less, and there's been huge efforts over the past few decades to, to, uh, to suppress the vote, to gerrymander, which means that politicians can pick their own voters so they, they don't face competition. So it's, um, you know, there's not like an ideal time to go back to, but certainly uh, we're, the democracy is really under attack right now, like I've never seen it in my lifetime. Um, this is more of a comment. It was someone who's talking about companies do not win in courts because of campaign contributions, but rather because of SCOTUS's grant them num numerous constitutional rights over many years. Um, and he's talking about supporting a 28th uh, Amendment um, to overturn Citizens United, like HJR, HJ2 is another one as well, um, to address corporate personhood, money is speech. So what is your take on some of that? I think that if, if I could wave my hand and have a constitutional amendment to rein in the influence of money in politics, that would be great. The fact is that a constitutional amendment is just extremely hard to achieve. I mean, look at the Equal Rights Amendment, which is uh, very uh, simple and more broadly supported comparatively to saying equal rights for men and women. And that took, um, how many years are we on? 50? I think we're about 50 years in to that. And um, it's just it's just really difficult and, and i think that um i think it's fine for people who are called to pursue that strategy i think we have uh, there's better luck with um pursuing democracy vouchers unrigging voting stopping voter suppression and some things that i think will will make more of a difference uh in the near term and then um someone's had a question about the democracy vouchers uh what portion of the democracy vouchers were actually used and um, I can answer that since I work with that program. And basically, uh, it went from this, the first year you mentioned your book, 80,000 vouchers, and just this last year in 2019, it was like over four times that amount. Um, so yeah, quite a bit has been used. And next year will be the first year it used for a mayoral campaign, just as an FYI. Another question is, I would like to get a sense of the table of contents of your book. Can you put it on your website? Is your table of contents on, I believe, uh, uh, it is in the book, Unrig? It's, uh, yeah, I don't think I have that up on my site, but I will, um, I'll uh, see what I can do to put it up there. And so next question from Chuck, how many other cities have adopted an honest elections program similar to Seattle? He's in Tacoma, calling from Tacoma. So in, in terms of democracy vouchers, the Seattle is the only one at present, but there are at least a dozen other cities across the country that have other forms of publicly funded elections. Like in, this, in New York City, for example, every dollar you, you donate to a, a city council campaign, the city matches it with another $8 from city funds. So the candidates can get 
all the money that they need and run for office and win without dependent on special interest money. So the, the, the voucher system is especially powerful because it, um, it educates people that they have something tangible to contribute and participate in politics. But these matching systems like in New York City and one in Berkeley, California, where I live and help pass that system are very powerful too. And I'd also like to call out Connecticut's system that uses abandoned state um, properties to fund that program, which is so it's not a tax. Next question, how do you see the connection of your book and the issue to the race issue in the US? As Nancy McLean brought out in her book, and as we also see with William Barber in North Carolina. Well, there are just so many uh, connections between race and democracy. I mean, movements led by black Americans have been central to improving democracy in this country. So in the 1960s, when the civil rights movement came to national attention, I mean, so much of that was centered on voting rights and the right to the most basic form of participation. And remember that just for, for wanting to vote, this, um, that, um, that people in that movement were killed and beaten. And, and going, um, going back uh, further to the early 1900s, uh, women seeking the vote were beaten and tortured uh, after protesting in front of the White House, the first group actually ever to do so. So this is, this, the, the right to vote is so powerful and has been so bitterly fought by, um, by uh, the people who want to expand it and then um, the interest groups who want to prevent the, the vote from expanding. And so I, I think that the, um, that the movements led by Black Americans, including the Black Lives Matter movement against racial injustice that we now find are, are just so essential because democracy already works for some people, right? There's already people who always have their voices heard, but there's so many people who don't have their voices heard and that's what improving our democracy really needs to be about. Great, um, and then uh, is the rest of Washington state going to get democracy vouchers? And then uh, Melinda recommends Irresistible, the John Stewart's movie. Funny, but eye-opening. I have not seen it yet. Um, I can speak to that. Yes, we would love to see vouchers for the rest of the state, but we have a ways to go. A public funding of elections is not a priority for legislators. So we may have to look at the ballot again at some point, um, but more to come on that. Um, yeah. Next question. Uh, well. In Clark County, Washington, I'm an elections advisory member for DEF, but there is no ASL voter pamphlet. And reason they said is it costs money, assumption that um, all DEF read English fluently, um, and that I do not, however, think your book is, let see, I do, however, think your book is good with visuals. Thank you. So basically addressing the ASL issue in that assuming that uh, DEF people all speak English. So I think it's about where do we put our resources in society, right? So election administrators, like, unfortunately, are really under-resourced for all the things they're trying to do. And why is that? There's not really um, an organized, enough people organizing and say, you know, elections are important. Voting is important. We need to include everyone. So get involved with the League of Women Voters. Get involved with Fixed Democracy First and the other groups on my website, Unrig Book. Uh, calm. And it, it really, um, as shown in the Seattle example, it doesn't take that many people to really create a tipping point. The difference is if you're in your home and you're posting things on social media and you're talking to your friends uh, about and complaining about politics, like that is not what changes things. What changes things is being in an organized group where you all decide to do something together and you link up with other groups and that's how change occurs. And I recommend that like in Clark County, for example, you could reach out to there's groups in Clark County, like the league, the local leagues, and then go down and talk to your elected officials about that issue. Sometimes that's sometimes to get the ball rolling. That's what it takes. Uh, the next question on your website, you mentioned proportional representation as a solution strategy. How do you see that becoming a reality and in what form? There are several. So per, variations on proportional representation have been around in different jurisdictions in the country, mostly local jurisdictions, on and off for, for years. And um, I, I think that there's a couple, proportional representation, by the way, it's, it's you have a bunch of candidates on your ballot and you, instead of just voting for one, you, you rank them first, second, third choice. And then 
you and then several candidates get elected all together instead of the way it is now where it's like I have this person I sort of like and this person I really don't like with proportional recommendation you have a lot more candidates running you're much more likely to find somebody you really like and then more people get elected together so instead of like say three congressional districts with three separate uh, votes in each of those districts, you have like one giant district that elects three members of Congress. And the, the point of doing it this way is you get more diversity of all sorts. So you get more ideological diversity. Uh, if you're a Republican in a Democratic majority district, your voice never counts right now. Or the reverse, if you're a Democrat and it's a majority Republican district, like it really doesn't matter. But in these proportional representation systems, then you the, the, the elected legislators represent the people's interests and uh, and philosophy is much better. In um, most Western democracies, like in Europe, for example, have proportional representation. The US was one of the early democracies back in the day, but then uh, others have kind of come ahead, moved ahead in terms of like what method of counting votes really gives the best representation. And um, I'm going to uh, ask a question that I have. Um, so why the comic route? I think it's very fascinating. It's, I've never seen a democracy book like this. Why did you choose to go that route? And I know that George O'Connor, your, your illustrator, your artist is on the call tonight or is on the webinar tonight as well listening in. So I just wanted to mention that and ask why you chose that route. So there's this misperception that democracy issues are just too complicated to understand. But I know that's not true. For 15 years, I've been running MapLite, a democracy organization exposing money's influence on politics, promoting social change and political reform. And I've talked to so many people who, when I just explain, well, actually, it's, it's not that complicated. It's about like this money game to politicians because they depend on it. And if they can get the money from the public, then they don't have strings attached, for example. And the light bulb goes on in their heads. And I've read a lot of books on democracy that are really uh, important, thick prose books that talk about all the problems in democracy, but they don't say much about the solutions. And, and so I created this comic book with George O'Connor, this outstanding, talented illustrator, to, uh, to make it easy for people to enter, for people to, to understand, oh, I get this, I can read this this comic book is really not that complicated. And in fact, there's people in this book who like, who look like me, you know, who are maybe the same age as me, everyone from Samantha Parsons at age 18 to elsewhere in the book, I talk about the badass grandmas of North Dakota who eliminated uh, secret money in North Dakota. And to, it really gives people an, an entry point uh, that can reach a much broader audience in a traditional book and also give the sense of fun and inspiration that we all need. It's great. And, you know, I bought a copy for my grandkids because I thought that might expose and I thought it would be a good um, way to expose younger people to democracy issues because there is illustrations and they're used to that. So I'm excited to see young people actually embrace the book. Um, so I have a couple more questions for you. For you, How do you think the recent Supreme Court ruling might affect grassroots efforts to abolish the Electoral College? So the, the Supreme Court ruling that, that just came out within the last day or so said that, uh, so this has to do with the electoral college. And so um, many people don't know this, but like the president in the U.S. is actually not elected by like your vote going to the voting booth. You are electing what's called electors in your state, which are people that then elect the president. And this system has historical roots that don't make any sense anymore. And I go through that in some detail in my book. Uh, but the Supreme Court decision said that the electors have to vote for the people that um, that they're supposed to vote for instead of being what's called faithless electors like, oh, well, someone was elected to support this candidate and they, they switch. Um, so it was sort of clarified this 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 rule that um, that I think probably most people thought the system worked this way anyway, the electors vote for who they thought they were vote for. Now, the national popular vote is really the solution to this mess of the Electoral College. And the, electoral the national popular vote is an agreement among states. And the states pass these laws. And there's uh, over a dozen states that have already passed this law that says, we're going to award all our electoral votes to the winner of the popular vote nationwide. Okay? And if enough states pass this, this state law, then that, that means is that the Electoral College will no longer be relevant, what will happen is that all the elector, enough electors will be awarded to, um, 
to uh, elect the person who gets the most votes nationwide. And so you can see that you really need a comic book to explain this, right? Because I'm trying to explain it verbally and it's really hard. But in the book, it kind of lays it out uh, a lot more clearly. So in terms of the terrific efforts to pass this national popular vote law in the states, I think this will be a boost to the effort because it continues to put the focus on our electoral college, which really doesn't work anymore. And, and twice in the last 20 years has elected two presidents that, um, uh, the uh, Bush versus Gore, Bush winning uh, while Gore won the popular vote, and of course, Donald Trump winning the presidency while Hillary Clinton received three million more votes than him. And the next question, uh, please speak to the process of wealth hoarders corrupting the ethics of individuals and politicians. What human or civic weakness or shortfallings are wealth hoarders exploiting? Uh, that's, that's a deep question, but I think important to ask. So yeah, I, I don't really think you have to go very far into human motivation uh, to, to figure that out. And, and one, um, one of the most successful levers is primary challengers. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So the, um, the, the wealth hoarders uh, have set up essentially what's an, an independent political organization, independent from the Republican Democratic parties. They have, um, they have ad makers, they have pollsters, they have um, a large grassroots organizing wing, they have think tanks. And so they have used this to put pressure, especially on the Republican party and the Democrats to a large, to some extent as well. And so what, what the wealth hoarders started doing is after the Citizens United Supreme Court ruling in 2010, that allowed any wealthy person or corporation to spend as much money as they wanted in politics. And, uh, and that interacted with the existing law to allow that spending happen in secret. And so that was the opening for these wealth hoarders who have uh, unlimited checkbooks, essentially. Uh, the worth of Charles Koch is $50 billion. So they started running candidates against any Republican who wasn't sufficiently libertarian enough for them. So let's give you the example of Orrin Hatch, former senator from Utah, very conservative senator. Back uh, 20 years earlier, he co-created a program called children's health insurance program to help with children's health care. He did this in collaboration with, with Democrats and they worked out something that both Republicans and Democrats could agree on. But then uh, just a few years ago, the Republican Congress passed massive tax cuts to the wealthy. The overwhelming majority uh, of the tax cuts went to the various wealthy people and large corporations. And that change in Orrin Hatch's philosophy came after uh, the, the wealth hoarders funded a primary opponent against him in the Republican primary who uh, campaigned on eliminating government, eliminating all taxes, eliminating government programs. And Orrin Hatch was like, you know, I almost lost my race. I don't, I don't, I'm gonna tow the wealth hoarder line. And so that's how this change has occurred, is that sometimes the wealth hoarders get their preferred candidates elected, but sometimes the people in office, they wanna keep their jobs in Congress or in the state capitals. And they say, you know, I'm just gonna change my point of view to do what these wealthy funders want me to do. And the next question ties into that. It, it refers to the 1971 Lewis Powell memo to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, attack on American tree, free trade enterprise. Um, Andrew says it was the Omaha Beach of the invasion of democracy. How do you see that event um, effect on the U.S. and where we are? Because I see it connected. Yeah, so the, the Powell memo. So uh, first of all, there's this outstanding movie called Heist, H-E-I-S-T, Heist. That is uh, that tells the whole story of, of the Powell, menu, Powell memo and has many of the, the uh, related themes to my book. The uh, so back in the 19, uh, especially in the 1950s and 60s, there was a wave of collection collective action in the country. The, um, the civil rights movement, environmental movement, consumer movement, and this forced. Um, forced change in the country. It, it created the Environmental Protection Agency and the Occupational Health and Safety to, to make sure that people had safe work, workplaces and, and so many more improvements to society. And the, um, the corporations who didn't want any of the things were kind of knocked on their heels. And so Lewis Powell, who was a, uh, a corporate attorney, he wrote this, this what's now infamous memo laying out to corporate the largest corporations in the country 
that you need to get involved in politics. You need to start lobbying. You need to start giving money to politicians. You need to start uh, advertising to change the terms of the policy debate. And so that was a turning point. And, and so businesses, corporations did start participating to, to tilt government to their own ends. And then, um, so that's, uh, that's the Powell memo. I do want to add that a couple months after he wrote that, Nixon, Nixon appointed him to the Supreme Court. And within a few years after that, we got um, the, uh, the, uh, the, I'm sorry, the speech, money is speech. I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on yeah, that. Buckley versus Vallejo. Thank you, Bu Buckley versus Vallejo, yes. Yeah. Um, and then we only have a couple minutes left and uh, some of the questions talk about, well, where do we go from here? What can people do? How can they get involved? How, what kind of impact can we have? We have an upcoming election. Um, you know, what can people do? So the number one thing you can do is join a group that's working on these issues. And there's, there's a list of groups in, on my site, unrigbook.com. Also in the last chapter of my book, I go in some detail into like how exactly do you do this and, and get involved. But I will say that, that the state level and local levels are the place where one person is the most likely to be a tipping point and make a difference. I mean, Seattle's a large city. Look what 10 people did, 10 people to start this movement that's now a, a shining example for the country of democracy vouchers. And that's happened story after story in, in uh, cities and states. So get together with people in your city or your state and find out what people are already doing and work to support that. It's amazing how much difference one person can make as long as they were doing that in alignment with a group of other people too. I think that's so important to reach out to your local. There's a lot of local groups um, that are very active as well as nationally. And as I don't think a lot of people know, but in 2018, we passed more pro-democracy reform than any time in our country's history, which means there's a lot of activity going on. And almost, I think every state has something going on. So I think you just need to reach out. The, like I mentioned, League of Women Voters, organizations like ours, Common Cause. Um, there's so many. And Dan mentioned on his book, I want to call out his book again. Um, I put a link to that. It's unrigbook.com that you can go and find more information about that. So closing comments, um, Dan, before we wrap it up for tonight. So I want people to know that, um, that change is not only possible, but it's already happening. Reading the news, like you will never read good news. Like the, the way the news media is set up is that they talk about problems and not solutions, but the solutions are actually gone going on all around the country. And you can be part of the movement to make those happen. Great, thank you so much. I apologize if we didn't get to all your questions. You feel free to um, send us an email. You can reach Dan through his website or uh, you can reach uh, me through Fix Democracy First. Thanks again, Dan. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing with Maplight and everything else. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you all for being here. All right. Good night, everyone.